Good morning. Good to see everybody. Hope you had a good week. In spite of circumstances. We have uh, people on vacation, traveling. Uh, and so forth. I don't know where some are. Per se, I haven't been in contact with. We've had family in this week. In fact, they were, they were still there when I left this morning. So pray for them as they travel back up towards Chicago. We have visitors today. Make them welcome. Good to have you guys. Let's pray. Father, I thank you and I praise you that uh, you're our God, you're our Savior, that it's all about you, Jesus. That um, without you, without your sacrifice, without the God's perfect plan, uh, we would be hope, would be hopeless, helpless, nothing we could do. But because of your great love, Father, we thank you for this love. And we thank you and praise you for your sacrifice and for your grace, your mercy, Father. We thank you for your victory and that we can walk in that victory. So, Father, we just give you glory for that. And so, Father, we exalt you. We exalt the name of Jesus. We exalt the Father, the, the Spirit. Father, we just, we just pray that, uh, that you are exalted in our life. And, uh, Father, we know it's your desire. And your desire is to reveal yourself to us that we may know you in a more intimate way, that we may yield to you and rest in you and let you life out your life through us, that others will see you, that we can um, uh, have that Sabbath rest that you have promised us, Father. So we just... Uh, Ask for your spirit to reign supreme today. Father, just take our, our hearts and mold them and make them what you would have it to be in our, in our understanding. And may that, may that play out in our life. Father, I lift up those who are uh, not here today, those who are sick, those who are traveling on vacation. And for whatever other reason, Father, we just pray your blessings there and be with them. And bring them back uh, at, the, at the appropriate time, Father. So, Father, just uh, teach us today. Open up our heart to your truth that we may know you more intimately in these things. I ask and thank you for in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, remember, keep praying. We're still trying to discern what God's will is and uh, tell let one of us know, one of the session members, what you thought about last week and any thoughts or anything that maybe God has revealed to you. Uh, I, like you heard me say, Todd, you know, we, we got the Murdy and Leonard in uh, Florida and, and Rick, and I don't know who else is involved there. But uh, so we're going to move our session. We hadn't, had, we hadn't had a chance to talk, uh, get together and talk individually uh, with each other. So uh, uh, we have to move the session member back. So that's, we're not delaying things. We're just trying to uh, wait till we can all get together and talk about it. So we're, we're kind of spending this uh, extra two weeks here in prayer. But we ask you to do the same thing. Keep us in your prayer. And, and I said, if God reveals something to you, let us know. Let us know what you thought as we move forward and try to det uh, determine what he wants to do through us. Okay? Any questions? Okay, we are looking at some of the results of the cross. And, and last week we started on the chapter 7 about verses 14 and 15. And, and uh, I hope you've read it this weekend and looked at it and this week and looked at it again. It gets kind of confusing. Uh, I struggled with this, this passage for years uh, until I began to understand what the power of sin was until I began to read each little word separately and to ask myself these questions. You know, what does this mean? What does that word mean? Why is it here? You know, all of that. So I want to start back over that uh, today and kind of review just for a moment. But then we're going to, I'm going to kind of take a detour because it all ties in together uh, as we also look at the, of the law. You've heard me mention different things about the law. Uh, and all that ties in to what we're, what we're talking about here. And Paul addresses that a little earlier in this same chapter. So I'll, 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 I will be going over that also because uh, I think it will help uh, give us a greater understanding of what, what we're talking about. And remember, we're looking at the fact that the, the conflict, I mean, we all know that there's a conflict. If, if, if God says, and we read multiple passages, multiple passages, that we are holy, that we are perfected, that we are complete, that we are sanctified, that we're set apart, that we're sons of God, that we're saints, 
that were, that were kept for Christ. We looked at passage after passage after passage. We are the righteousness of God, you know. We looked at all those, all those many passages, and there's many more, that says who we are because of the cross. But that doesn't play out all the time, does it? In fact, if we're for honest, it don't play out hardly any of the time because the righteousness of God is perfection, isn't it? Absolute perfection. So that's what Paul is addressing here in Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through the end of the chapter. He says there's a battle that goes on. Why is that battle going on? If I'm this new creation, which I am, I'm the new creation in Christ. You know, that's not my position. That's who I am. I'm not a part new creation. I'm a total new creation. But if I'm this new creation, what's up with this? What's going on? Okay, so that's what we're going to be addressing. We're going to start off to review. So it's Romans chapter 7, verse 14. Paul says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh sold into bondage to sin. Okay? So the law is spiritual. It was given to God. It's, it's to, it's to well, we'll get, I'll get into that in a little bit. The law is spiritual. But he says, but Paul says, I'm of flesh. In other words, he says, I'm just a man. I'm just a human being. Right? And we've talked about this before. What you see is, as Heather says, my earth tent. This is just a temporary thing. It's not who I am. It's how you recognize me as we're human beings, but this is not who I am. Who I am is inside of what you see, which is my inner being, my spirit and soul, mind, heart, will, emotions, all that kind of stuff. That's my, that, that is who I am, and that has, that has been changed. It is a new creation. You look at the outside, the outside didn't change. Of course, as we grow older, the outside changes. But that's not who I am. But Paul says, I am flesh. I'm just a human being. But he goes on to say something else. He says that I am of, of the flesh sold into bondage, to the bondage to sin. And he's talking about the power of sin here. So basically what he's saying, he says this flesh houses the power of sin, which, we, which I read last, last week from uh, uh, the Vines Dictionary of the Greek and uh, Hebrew language, that, this, that the word harmatia means miss and mark, but at times, depending on the context, it is a force or a power that dwells in our bodies, each and every one of us. This power of sin is in our body. Okay? Any, any questions on that? So it's important that we, that we understand that as we go forward. Okay? So this power of sin is in our body. So verse 15. For that which I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I, would like to practice, what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing that I hate. All right. When Paul says, I do not understand, is, that's really probably not a good translation for us because D Paul, through the rest of this chapter, tells us exactly what's going on. So he does understand what's going on. What he's saying, he says, what I recognize as the new creation doesn't add up. That's what he's saying. He said, if I'm the new creation in Christ, which I am, he says, what I do, and we'll find that later on, what I think is not matching up with that. And we can all relate to that. We all know that, right? Something's different. If I'm this new creation, what's going on? If God doesn't have to do anything else, why do I have these thoughts? Why do I, have these, why do I carry out these thoughts, these actions and all that? What is going on? And that's what Paul's going to address. Okay? Now look at some, some of these words in here. For what I'm doing... For that which I am doing, I don't understand. In other words, it's not, it's not adding up. For what, for I am not practicing what I would like to do. All right. Paul said he's not doing, practicing, he's not doing what he would like to do. Here's the important thing to first understand. Paul, as the new creation, wants to do good. Regardless of what he feels and all that kind of stuff, Paul, as a new creation, always wants to do good. 
That's what he's saying. I'm not practicing that which I want to be doing. Do you feel like that? Do you feel like you always want to do good? Well, if you're the new creation, is it possible that you're binding to a lie? I think it's highly possible. In fact, I think that's, that's exactly what's going on. As the new creation, I always want to do good. I always want to do what God wants me to do. Because it's Christ in me, right? It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. But yet Paul says, I don't do it. I don't do it. You don't do it. So there is that battle. But Paul, as the new creation, always wants to do good. We keep reading. For what I am not practicing, see, see, I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I, I would like to do. He's clear what I would like to do. But I am doing the very thing I hate. What does the word thing stand for? What's it referring to? This is highly important to understand where this battle takes place. I'm doing the very thing that I hate. So we won't really understand that till we get to the end, okay? But he, he's letting you know that this thing that he hates, he's doing. Okay? Now, notice once again, Paul, as the new creation, hates this thing he's talking about. Whatever this thing is, he hates it. Doesn't say he likes it. Doesn't say he gets any enjoyment out of it. He said he hates it. Do you hate the thing you're doing as a new creation? Probably what you're going to say is, well, no. A lot of times I really kind of like it at the beginning. Or I think I like it. So let me ask you this question again. Is that really the new creation that's having this thought? Or am I being attacked by the power of sin in my body and bind into his lie? Have you ever thought about that? Think about it. As the new creation, Paul says, I'm not, very, not doing the very thing that I want to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. Let me keep reading. But if I do the very thing I do not wish to do, I agree with the law, confessing that it is good. All right, there's another point I want to that we'll bring up a little later on. Paul says right here that we just got finished reading that he's the one doing it, right? He's the one doing it. Right? He's, he, he's doing it. He's the one who's doing this thing that he hates, okay? So he also says that if I do this thing, that I totally agree with the law, confessing that it is good. All right, so this gets back into the reason, what was God's purpose for the law? Who was the law created for? Well, you say Israel, right? That's what really, that's, I mean, bottom line, that's God gave the law to Israel. Let me read you a verse. If you, in fact, if you would, turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. I'm going to start with verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. I want you to listen to what Paul says about the law. This is, man, so important. But we know that the law is good. So the law is good. We're going to find out later on the law is holy. God gave the law. Why? Who did he give it to? Well, Israel, right? Keep reading. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. In other words, the right way. Realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous man, but for those who are lawless, and rebellious for the ungodly and sinners. And he goes on and on, naming all those people it's made for. But the key is if what? Who was the law made for? Bottom line, the unrighteous. Think about that. 
the unrighteous. Had you never noticed that before? The law was made for the unrighteous. Why? Well, he said, well, clearly he gave it to Israel, right? But did they really grasp what the whole purpose of the law was? No, they didn't. Because they kept adding to it. You know, the law wasn't enough. I've got to get, get more and more. Because they thought that the law was going to save them. The law was made for the unrighteous. Let me ask you this, too. We've already read this weeks and weeks ago. This verse, he made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf that we might become what? The righteousness of God in Christ. So if I'm righteous now, which scripture clearly says I am if I'm in Christ, is the law for me? It's not. I am not under law. It's not made for me because I'm righteous now. But here's the thing about it. The law still in my life, in your life, and in Paul's life, still accomplishes it, accomplishes it what it's made for. The main reason it was made for. Galatians says the law is our tutor, what? To lead us to Christ. So bottom line, the law was made to eat my lunch, to know that I couldn't keep it, and that I needed a Savior. And once I had that Savior... I'm no longer under the law. So I'm never to hook myself up to law again. So what do I hook myself up to? To life. To Christ's life. His spirit in me. And we're going we're to read more about that. Okay? Any questions over that? The law, this is the key, the law was made for the unrighteous. Okay? We okay with that now? Turn back to Romans chapter 7. We're going to go back to the very beginning of Romans. By the way, I've got new notes. Uh, uh, you can pick up, you can pick up after. We're, we're pretty much done with the notes for, the, for this service. Romans chapter 7, verse 1. I'm going to start with verse 23 of chapter 6. Very, very familiar. Romans 6, 23. It says, For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Then Paul says in verse 7, I mean chapter 7 and verse 1, Or do you not know, brethren, for I'm speaking to those who know the law. So Paul's speaking to the ones... Remember, he's writing this to the church at Rome, which was predominantly Gentile, but there were also Jews there. So some of the Gentiles were probably not familiar at all with the law. They probably knew about the law from the Jews there, but they didn't know the law and everything it entailed because they wasn't brought up in that. They were Romans. They weren't Jews. So Paul says, okay, Jews, listen to me. Don't you know, those who know about the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? That's a key phrase. Basically, he's saying is to, to the Jews who know the law that, that you're under law as long as you're alive. All right, now what are we going to do with that? That sounds like a contradiction of what I've already said and what Paul said, doesn't it? Let's keep reading. And he gives an example. He says, For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he's living. In other words, under the Mosaic law, he says, A married woman is bound to her husband. Okay? Under the law. As long as he's living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning that husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she be joined to another man. So Paul says, according to the law, that man and woman are married, that the woman is bound to her husband as long as he's living. Right? That's what the law says. As long as this husband is living, this woman is to stay married to her husband. The husband is to stay married to this wife. But he says, if the husband dies, 
then this precept of the law no longer holds her to that husband. Okay? So for this woman to no longer be held to that husband, what has to happen? A death has to occur, right? Right? A death has to occur. Verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. This gets back to this question I asked several weeks ago. Who died? Paul says really clearly, as he's writing to the believers in Christ, he says, you, you were made to die to the law. So how does that happen? I can say that right now. Everyone here who knows Jesus as their Savior, you, me, we were made to die to the law. So a death has to occur, right, to be separated from the law. And Paul's clear in Romans uh, chapter 6. We are not under law. We are under grace. So some kind of death took place. There has to be a death. So how does that play out? Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for Christ. So it's not only, not only are we free from the law, this will also happen that we could bear fruit for Christ. So who died? Well, you did, but who were you when you died? That might be a better question. And that goes back to what we read in chapter 6, verse, uh, chapter, verse 6, I think. For he who has died is free from the law, you know. The old man, the old man, the old nature, who you were before, who I was before I accepted help, I need a Savior. That's who died. That's when I, we talked about, it really quickly ran through it, that the old man, who I was, was placed into what? The body of Christ, that's what he says. The body of Christ. I was placed into the body of Christ. I was crucified with Christ. For I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, right? I was crucified with Christ. I was placed in his body. I was buried with Christ. And I was raised as the new man to walk in newness of life. That I might bear fruit for Christ. So he did a complete work there. The old man was crucified. And buried, the new man was raised up, the new creation. Have you ever thought, let me ask, think about this. When we do we, uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper and take communion, we have the wine and we have the bread. The wine represents what? The blood of Christ. The bread represents the body of Christ. What does the blood do? It does away with our sin, right? It does away with our sin. What does the body do? You ever thought about it? Or you just take the bread and say, this is part of what I do. What does the body do? I was placed into the body of Christ as the old man and was crucified. See, the body of Christ takes care of my old nature. It's crucified with Christ. So, therefore, although we we're not set up for it and we generally don't do it, Think about baptism and immersion. That is, to me, the best example of what takes place. That the old man is crucified and what? Buried with Christ. And then raised to walk in newness of life, the new man. That's what the symbol of baptism, the best picture of it is. It shows the, the burial, that the old man has died and buried with Christ when you're immersed. And then they're raised when they come up out of the water to walk in newness of life as the new man. So from my perspective, although it doesn't have to be done this way, it, that gives you the best example of what has actually taken place. Questions? Everybody okay? 
All right, let's keep reading. <clears throat> Verse 5, for while we were in the flesh, in other words, this flesh he's talking about here is the old, the old man, the old nature. So while we were still sinners, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. Remember, the wages of sin is death. So what's he saying here? So while I was unsaved, while the old man was alive, the sinful passions, as an old man, the most natural thing I did was sin. That's who I was. I was a sinner. That's the most natural thing I did as the old man. So it says, <coughs> being the old man, the law, the Mosaic law, aroused all these sinful passions that the old man had caused me to sin, although it was my fault. I can't say the devil made me do it. It was my fault. And it killed me. In other words, I walked, I walked around like a dead man with no hope. Remember the wages of sin is death? I had no hope. I was separated. Remember, death also, basically, the basic meaning of death is separation. So I was separated, and by the very things I'd done and said and acted, proved that fact, without any doubt, that I was dead, that I was separated from Christ. But Paul said to the Jews, the law caused that, in a, in a sense. It wasn't the law's fault. The law was holy. God gave the law as a holy instrument, but could anybody keep it? Absolutely not. They couldn't keep it. So once again, the law served its function, was to show me, to show the Jews, they could not keep it. They could not meet God's righteous standard, and therefore they needed a Savior. This Savior that God promised Adam and Eve back in the garden. This Savior that they were looking for. The Savior that, from a so, very sorry, that many of them are still looking for. They missed him again. They missed the purpose of the law, and they missed the Savior. And they're missing the Savior. And most of the world is missing the Savior. Think about, think about, God has provided a way that you can walk and live in freedom. That we can live in power. That we can live in grace. And the world rejects it. The world rejects it. For six. But now we have been released from the law. Think about that, guys. I'm not under law. I've been released from the law. The law still does what it's supposed to do, right? Paul said... You know, the law is good and, and uh, the law convicts me when I sin. But it's even more than the law now. In, in, a, in a believer's life, it's the Spirit of God in him. And the Spirit will remind us, you're not supposed to steal, but you stole. So the law still functions, right? Still functions. Well, that all sounds good for the Jew. They had the law. What about the rest of the world who did not have the law and people who were living across the continents and didn't even know anything about Jews or know anything about Christ? What about their law? Did they have a law? You know, I think it's clear without any doubt that every one of us know, we can deny it, but we know that there is a moral law. We know that some things are just wrong. You don't have to have the Ten Commandments. You don't have to have the Mosaic Law to know some things are wrong. Where does that come from? You know, the, the, uh, the apologists, they've got kind of a, a stair-stepping thing, and basically what they say said, because any, most anybody will admit there's evil. So if there's evil, there has to be good, Right? There has to be a standard. So if there's evil, there has to be good. And if there's good, there has to be a moral law. I have to know in just inherently 
as a human being that some things are wrong. Now, I can reject it. I can push that down all day long, but it don't change the fact that I know some things are wrong. And if there's some things are wrong, there has to be a standard to judge right and wrong. Correct? There's got to be a standard to judge right and wrong. And if there's that standard in every human being, there has to be a moral law that's in each and every one of us. If there's no God, where did that moral law come from? So see, if there's a moral law, there had to be a moral law giver. So if there's evil, there has to be good. If there's good, there has to be a moral law. If there's a moral law, there has to be a moral law giver. Therefore, God said everyone is accountable. Everyone. Through creation, through the moral law, everyone knows that there's a higher being who's good. But now we, as believers, have been released from the law, having died so that by which we were bound, to that, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we might serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldest of the letter. Having died, once again, you've got to answer that question. Who died? It was the old man. Did he die positionally? Well, if he just died positionally, then I'm just positionally free. I'm just positionally not under law. Guys, that'll never work. It will not work. It doesn't add up with what Scripture says. The old man died. And the new man was raised, the new creation in Christ. So now we're not bound by the law because we've died to the law. So what? So that we serve in newness of spirit. Not in, this, not in the oldness of the letter. So now as a believer, it's the spirit in me, the very life of Christ that should be guiding me, that should be convicting me, that should be leading me where I need to go, that should be speaking to me, the very life of Christ in me to guide me. Well, how do you beat that deal? But yet, where's this, this conflict is still there, right? We all know it's there. Let me keep reading. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. Now listen to this. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So see, a coveting, coveting is, not, is a sin that's not always seen. But where is it? Where is it? It's in my heart. It's in my inner being. So much of the time. Now, I can act that on it and then it's seen, but I can covet all day long and you may never see it. You may never know it. But it's there because, because the law says you shall not covet. So once again, the law came what? As we read earlier, that sin might increase. In other words, that I would recognize sin and all the different aspects of it and to realize that I can't keep it. I need a Savior. I have no hope of being good enough. No hope of being good enough. Verse 8. <clears throat> now listen to this. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment. What are we talking about, sin? An act of sin? No. It's talking about the power of sin that's in my body. He said, Paul's saying, but sin, the power of sin in your body took an opportunity through the commandment And produced in me coveting of every kind, for apart from the law, sin is dead. So in other, in other words, what he's saying, if there's no law, then the power of sin doesn't, doesn't, say, doesn't hook me up to that. Remember we talked about last week, you know, wet paint, don't touch it. What do you do? Reach out there and touch it, just to see if it's wet. Stay off of grass, you know. Where does that come from? power of sin in my body tempting me and we're, we'll get a little further into that I was once alive apart from the law but when the commandment came sin became alive and I died in other words Paul said before, before, before there was a law I thought I was doing okay I could do this I could do that you know and you know, the law didn't just spell it out so I thought you know hey I'm, I'm probably okay 
But then when the law said, thou shalt not covet, and I realized this person over here has what I want, I really want that. You know, I'm not going to take it from him because that would be stealing, but I really want that. And what happens? God says, thou shalt not covet. So Paul realizes what I was doing the whole time was wrong. It was a sin. And as, and as such, I was separated from God because that sin had not been paid for. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. So God gave us a commandment to show us how we should live, how we should think, what we should be doing. But he knew what? That we wouldn't do it. So when the commandment came, I should have realized I couldn't do it and needed a Savior. But I also realized what? That I absolutely could not do it and I had no hope. So then, he, then Paul realized, you know, when I was in that state, I realized that I was separated from Christ. I could try to keep the law as best I could, but it was never going to happen. And <laughs> it always amazes me if, uh, when I think back to the, it just shows the power of deception of Satan. I think back to how well the Pharisees, the teachers, the scribes knew the law, how well they knew it. Of course, they focused on the Pharisaic law more so, but they knew the law. What did they think, I wonder, when they read what we read before in, in Galatians, and which comes from the Old Testament law, cursed is every man, is everyone, who does not keep all the words written in the book of the law. <coughs> what do you think they thought? Or did they do like we do much of the time? Just kind of bypass it and go on. Cursed is everyone who does not keep all of the words written in the book of the law. That convicts everybody. What'd they do? They made more laws. How much today have we talked about that you never thought about before and just read right past it? When I see when I think about it that way, I understand. I understand. Every time I go into to something like this, I would just, uh, like I said, we've had family, and you know, I thought, I told them yesterday, I said, I need to spend a little time. I didn't think it would take but just a minute. Every time I get back into it, God shows me something else. Leads me on another path. Reveals a little more so what he's trying to say. But if we just blow through it, just go through life with our ears stopped up, it's to our detriment. God wants to show us so much, you know. How many times have we hooked ourselves up in the easy things to the Ten Commandments? we got to do this. Well, you know when we do that, we're bound to fail because the Ten Commandments, part of the law, was given to make us sin more, to help us realize we can't keep it. Now, are they still good? They are good. It's already said that. If you keep reading, it says they're holy. So they're good laws. They're holy laws. They give an a ideal of God's requirement. But it also shows that I can't do it. I've got to have a Savior. And praise God. Praise God. He sent us a Savior. He made that available. That we can do that. And we can walk in newness of life. But it won't be through hooking ourselves up to law. But that don't change the battle, does it? There's still that battle going on. Now, that all sounds good and easy. I'm up here telling you how we can do it, but I ain't getting it. <laughs> I still don't see that in my life all the time. So that battle is still there. So as we go on next week, we're going to talk a little more about that battle and really what's taking place, at least so we can be aware and so that we can try to be on our guard and try to be yielded more to the Spirit. All right, everybody get all that. Any questions? I hope God has given us something to think about today and something to, to dwell on a little and to, to also understand we're not hopeless. And Paul, if we finish our Romans 7, we're going to see that the, he says, praise God, it's through Jesus Christ our Lord that we can walk in this victory, that we can walk in the manner, this newness of life. Will we do it perfectly? Nah.
That's still that battle going on. And no matter how much I know, no matter how much I start yielding, I'm still, I am still got to deal with that on this earth. And I'm still immature in certain areas. But praise God, he's made a way. In Jesus' name, amen.